become a Renaissance movement. Don't be a popular slave or a slave of popular culture. Be the inspirator of a Renaissance movement, and then we can turn it around. <clears throat> My name is Helga Zepler-Rouge. Um, as you said, I founded the Schiller Institute, I think it's now 30, whatever, 38 years ago. No, wait a second, 37 years ago. Um, I was married with Lyndon LaRouche for 41 years and we enjoyed a very productive life together doing many, many, many political things in the world. And the Schiller Institute was you know, one of the means because this was the arm with which we did international political things like conferences, interventions, you know, seminars, many, many things like that. So I don't know, I cannot describe my <clears throat> political activity because it's very, very rich and has many aspects to it. What were the circumstances of the world uh, and the conditions of the world around 1984 that prompted you to found the Schiller Institute? Well, you know, this was a very turbulent time because many people were concerned that we, are, we, we were on the verge of World War III because you had the so-called middle range missile crisis in Europe with the Pershing 20 and the SS, uh, the Pershing 2 and the SS 20 being directed against each other between NATO and the Warsaw Pact because the Soviet Union still existed. And all these missiles were on launch on warning. And the danger was that if only one of these missiles would have been appearing on the screen or the radar screen of the other side, there would have been an automatic launch because the warning time was so brief. So many people correctly were concerned that we were really in danger of going into World War III by mistake even. So there were peace movements. There were hundreds of thousands of people in the streets of Europe protesting against that. And I was traveling with my husband, Lyndon LaRouche, in the United States in the context of his presidential campaign. And I saw that many Americans were extremely anti-German because of these demonstrations, not quite getting it what it was all about. And then I traveled in Germany and I saw that there were many people extremely anti-American because you know they perceived a war danger coming from these deployments. So I thought that you know if this is not changed, that there was the danger of a decoupling. And you know, so I, I thought that in any case, my experience was that foreign policy among nations was really bad. You know, I, I could not see there was a lot of talk about the allies and you know <clears throat> values and so forth, but the reality was that wherever you would look, you would see that the foreign policy would be interventions, meddling, uh, even coups, um, you know, what you would call nowadays regime change until you had the government, which was the one uh, certain circles wanted. So I thought that this whole thing was all on a completely wrong basis and that you needed to restate foreign policy in a completely different way. And I thought that rather than focusing on issues of the day, that the best way to get relations among nations on a better grounding would be if each nation would relate to the best tradition of the other one. Uh, with other words, that when you are talking about the United States uh, abroad, you're not just talking about the Vietnam War and this, what you don't like about the United States or that, but that you would focus on the American Revolution, on the American Constitution, on Lincoln, on the things you know America can be proud of, but that vice versa, that the United States would do the same in respect to other nations. Like when you talk about Germany, you're not just talking about 12 years of National Socialism, but you're talking about the German classics, Schiller, Beethoven, the classical music, uh, Leibniz, and many other beautiful things about Germany. And you would do that with every nation. So I made this proposal 
uh, to create such an institute to improve the relationship first between Germany and the United States. But then while we were organizing for the founding of it, it became clear that this was a problem not only for Germany and the United States, but for all of Europe. So uh, when we founded the Schiller Institute first in July in Arlington, and then uh, in September in Wiesbaden, we had already 50 nations in, in Arlington, 50 nations participating. So 50 people from different countries would march into the hall where the conference took place, uh, carrying their national flag, their national anthem being uh, played. And you had immediately this beautiful international spirit right from the beginning. But then it was clear this was not enough to be a, a, a new format between the United States and Europe, but this was all the more needed in respect to the so-called advanced sector with the developing countries. So the third conference, which took place in November of that year, already had the participation of many trade union leaders from Latin America and representatives from Africa, from Asia. So that was really uh, how the Schiller Institute started with a very powerful uh, dynamic right from the beginning. Well, that's great because I know, I think a few years later, actually, uh, you have something called the Declarations for the Rights of Man, right? Um, or or something, something along those lines where you make a whole new declaration, basically laying out the new rights of mankind. Could you explain that to me a little bit more? No, no, that was a little bit different. Oh, okay. uh, when, when I founded the Schiller Institute, I was looking through all international charters, uh, you know, statutes, because I thought that the Schiller Institute had to be put on an extremely high level grounding. So I looked at the UN Charter and many other such documents, and then also at the Declaration of Independence. And I thought that that would express in the best way what was the intention of the Schiller Institute, except that I did not think it was only for the United States, but it should apply for the whole world. So what I did is I took the liberty to change just something like six or seven words where it says uh, in the Declaration of Independence, you know, that this uh, refers to the American colony. I just said it refers to all the countries of the world or where, it, you know, so I made the changes just tiny changes so that it would apply uh, <clears throat> for you know every single country of the world. And I thought that this was very important because the rights uh, expressed in the Declaration of Independence should be the rights of every country in the world. And also I thought it would be a very good pedagogical way to, for the Americans to understand that, you know, that while America has a very specific role in history, that you know, they should also understand that exactly the same rights are the rights of every country, which by the way, was the view of John Quincy Adams. So that is why the Declaration of Independence and the statutes of the Schiller Institute are almost identical. Then you named the Schiller Institute after the German poet, Frederick Schiller. Now, how does Frederick Schiller reflect the values that you're talking about here? Well, I mean, I think I wanted to introduce something which normally is lacking in politics, and that is that, you know, the center of it is the image of man. Because the image of man you have determines, you know, what is your policy if you regard human beings as sacred, as individual life, as absolutely sacred. Uh, so, you know, since I think that each human being uh, should be regarded as a potential genius, a potential beautiful soul. Um, I thought that the best idea was really the most beautiful expression, the most lofty uh, notion of such an idea I found in Schiller. You know, I mean, there are many beautiful thinkers in throughout universal history, but I have found nobody who had such a power of language, such a noble idea of men. Uh, mankind. So that is why I thought for our efforts, uh, this should, you know, <clears throat> be, be the name of Schiller. And since the goal of the Schiller Institute was from the beginning 
to fight for a just new world economic order for the development of all nations on this planet. But it was also clear to me that this could only succeed if you would combine that with a, just, with a classical a renaissance of classical culture. And both these ideas you find in Schiller, who basically you know, was convinced that the only way you could get an improvement in politics was through the ennoblement of the individual. This was his answer to the French Revolution, which he thought had failed completely. And he, you know, in the aesthetical letters, he basically developed this idea that it was only through the ennoblement of the individual that you could uh, basically get an improved political outcome. So, you know, and since Schiller was emphatically uh, both a patriot and a world citizen, and he always said there is no difference between a, 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 a patriot and, and a world citizen, I thought that, you know, this fitted what I wanted to do politically perfectly. Yeah, Mrs. La LaRouche, you were just talking about the um, mission of the Schiller Institute of, you know, creating a new just economic order and a paradigm by which nations can develop one another in the third world. So how has this mission evolved and adapted for the past 37 years? And also you, you make a big point, you know, in your conferences about developing the youth, de developing their creativity. So how have we been intervening in the, um, to shift the culture and shift um, and uplift younger generations? Well, I think if one reflects on how much the Schiller Institute did in five continents uh, in almost four decades, I think we can be quite proud um, because, you know, we have set the tone on many sub subjects. And I think the Schiller Institute <clears throat> today is regarded in the world by many countries and many forces in, the, in many countries as the sort of opposite of oligarchism, uh, as the idea of Republican freedom, as the idea of classical standards in culture, because we have, we have done conferences on space. We did work with Kraft Erike, the uh, exceptional space pioneer. <coughs> Uh, Kraft Erika, who, you know, developed uh, some of the rockets for the Apollo program, uh, who had a beautiful vision for the future. We worked on philosophy. We had uh, conferences in Rome with uh, participation of the Vatican on Augustinus. We had a Verdi tuning campaign where all the major uh, top singers of the world practically participated. Um, yeah, there were so many things we were always fighting for economic development plans for Africa, for Asia, for Latin America. We worked with Indira Gandhi on a 40 year development program for India. We worked with Lopez Portillo, the president of Mexico on the Latin American economic integration. Uh, naturally, <clears throat> we had many economic development programs for uh, the United States, for Europe, the Eurasian land bridge. So <clears throat> I think now, just to, to think about it, we set the tone and inspired many forces uh, around the world. I think we have inspired many young people in five continents, and there is a solid sort of, you know, grouping of people who understand that there needs to be a classical renaissance of classical culture. But unfortunately, you know, we also are in a world where the decadence around us is, is just absolutely increasing. Uh, I think the present cultural collapse of what you call the Western countries, you know, is really only to be compared with the end phase of the Roman Empire. If you look at the suicide rates, the drug addiction, the satanic nature of the popular culture, um, I think, unfortunately, the environment in which the Schiller Institute is working has absolutely uh, severely become worse. So does that mean that uh, I give up or we give up? No, it does not mean that. It means that our efforts are all the more important. Uh, and I think, 
it's very clear that we are heading either towards a real dark age and we are very far into it already or we can get enough people to see that and therefore join our efforts so that we can turn it around and create a renaissance so as i said you know it's a it's a mixed situation on the one side it's very good on the other side it's very dangerous mrs larouche when you first started the um schiller institute how did you envision the future what did you think the future would be like and what was your conception then of what 2020 would be like well i didn't think about 2020 in particular but i i was actually quite optimistic that we would succeed much quicker to establish <clears throat> a just new world economic order um, because as i mentioned you know we worked with the non-aligned movement uh, we worked on development programs for africa uh, on an oasis plan for the middle east uh, we worked on a 50-year development plan for the pacific basin uh, latin american integration so since this is the aspiration of so many people in the world i was actually optimistic that we would succeed uh, much closer to the actual moment of the founding of the Institute. But, you know, as it now turns out, the forces of the oligarchy, of the empire, of those who want to have a geopolitical confrontation, they really don't give up. And, you know, I remember very well in 1989, 1990, when the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union collapsed in 91, I made many speeches warning that if one would make the mistake and superimpose on the collapsed Soviet Union um, the neoliberal economic system, that you know maybe one could get maximum profit for a short period of time for the speculators and the banks, but then an even larger collapse would be looming. And unfortunately, uh, people, you know, proceeded exactly with that by superimposing a neoliberal economic model. And that's why we are at the absolute point of crisis we are today, you know, <clears throat> with the looming of another major financial collapse, much worse than 2008, uh, the pandemic naturally, world famine of biblical dimensions. So, you know, does that mean that my predictions uh, were <clears throat> uh, not right. No, I think they were right, exactly that, you know, this mistake was made. But fortunately, you know, we also have uh, the, other develop the other development that the original pro program of the productive triangle, which was our answer to the collapse of the uh, GDR, the East Germany and the German unification. Um, I worked with Lynn on this idea um, to have an economic integration of East and Western Europe. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, we extended that into the Eurasian land bridge. And this is now practically the reality which is pursued by China with the new Silk Road. And there are 150 countries working with that new conception, which is very much in affinity what Lyndon LaRouche and I were working on for the last for decades practically so you know it's a mixed it's it's it, the situation is full of potentials but full of dangers as well this is why we need more people to work with the schiller institute to make sure that we are ending on a positive note and not in a catastrophe you know um ms larouche you and your husband have such a way of staying optimistic you know, in spite of the conditions of the world and the tragedies of, of the world and, and how ugly it looks, how are you able and to what role, or I guess, to what extent does classical art um, help in, in, in not just keeping yourself, but, but how can it help others to see the beautiful potential in the world rather than being absorbed by the ugliness of the world? Well, I think you answered it yourself already because, you know, I mean, okay, I'm not, I'm not insulin or, you know, not affected by what's going on around me. You know, for example, when I see the genocide going on right now with the sanctions 
against uh, Yemen and, and Syria, it really upsets me greatly because this is, I mean, this is genocide. Um, one cannot call it any other way. So it's not that I'm, you know, not being affected by, <clears throat> by reality around me, but I can say that I have never, really never doubted that, you know, the world needed to be improved. And, you know, when you go to the best minds of universal history, which have lived so far in all cultures, in, you know, Asian culture, in America, in, in European culture, African culture, and you, you, you steep your mind <clears throat> in those ideas like Leibniz, Plato, Schiller, Beethoven, Shakespeare, <clears throat> Well, in a certain sense, then that becomes your identity. And then I ask many people uh, all the time, I said, you should have your own idea. You know, it doesn't matter how old you are. How do you want the world to look like in a few years, in a few decades, when you end your life? And once you have that idea clearly formed in your life, in your mind, then you, you're working to realize that. And, you know, I think that that is something which, which motivates me. And since I'm inspired by such people as Schiller and, and Lessing and many others, um, you know, in a certain sense, I'm inner directed. I'm not depending on outside influences to, to make my judgments and to make my opinions. You know, you were just, you were just talking about and when I had asked you the question of how you would envision the future, you thought things would go much more smoothly and you're very optimistic. But now, as we're in 2021, we see the brutal sanctions against Syria. We see the famine in Yemen and, you know, much other dangerous situations like that of COVID and of war. So what should we do and what should the earth look like in the next 50 years with the interventions of the Schiller Institute? And how should we intervene to ensure that every person in the world by then has a meaningful and prosperous life, which they can contribute to the development of their society and the entire world? Well, I think that there are a couple of objectives which are absolutely necessary to be accomplished if humanity is supposed to get out of this crisis. And I've said many times, you know, you have to start with a world health system because you know this pandemic is not over. Uh, as a matter of fact, this virus is mutating. You have new dangerous uh, variants, and you know this can come back. And we are in a race against time, where you know the question is: Will all people on the planet be vaccinated in time uh, before there are variants which uh, nullify the effect of the vaccines? of the people who are already vaccinated. So it's really a, a very dangerous situation. And you know, even if we defeat this virus, there are many viruses uh, waiting out there to be a new pandemic. So I have made emphatically the point that we need a modern health system in every single country, even the poorest ones. They need to have modern hospitals, well-educated uh, personnel, doctors, nurses, health workers, but to have modern hospitals, you need uh, electricity, you need clean water. You only get that when you have infrastructure and you only get that if you have an industrialization and the development of agriculture. So I think we have to learn the lesson from this pandemic. pandemic. Nobody will be safe unless everybody is safe. And we have to use this crisis to overcome the underdevelopment of the developing countries for good. In a certain sense, what Franklin D. Roosevelt had intended with Bretton Woods, but which never was realized. And naturally, Lyndon LaRouche has devoted his entire life work to have such a, a development of the developing countries. That's why I joined him uh, <clears throat> in the beginning of the 70s, because I had traveled you know, in my famous trip to China in 71, in the middle of the Cultural Revolution, and then touching on some you know, countries in Africa. And I came back from that trip with the absolute conviction that this underdevelopment could not be tolerated. And I found in Lyndon LaRouche, the only person 
who powerfully spoke about the need to develop Africa with infrastructure. So I think that that is the absolute necessary question. That will be the test of morality if mankind is fit to survive or not. So I think that that is really what, what has to occur. And um, I think that, you know, otherwise, you know, I think people have to learn the lesson how you make a renaissance. And one can actually study that, you know, because there were dark ages before and people got out of it. For example, you know, I, I always like to look at for example, one can look at the Arab Renaissance, the Abbasid dynasty of the seven, eight hundred century uh, after Christ. Uh, you know, the, the caliphs, Harun al Rashid and Al Manmur, Al Mansur, they, they sent emissary to the whole world, which was known at the time to Egypt, to Spain, to Italy, to Greece, and asked people to bring back all knowledge. And you know, at that point, Baghdad was the most developed uh, city. Uh, then you have the, and Europe regained its old culture, uh, which it had lost when the Roman Empire collapsed, by having ex uh, exchanges between Harun al Rashid and Charlemagne. Uh, and you had a small Renaissance, the Carolingian Renaissance in Europe. So then you had another example. Uh, which was the Italian Renaissance. This was after the 14th century, uh, which was a real dark age with the Black Death and one third of the population dying. But then people went back to the sources. Uh, you know, this was always the cry of the humanists. You have to go back to the sources. Um, that meant Plato, that meant, you know, <clears throat> that meant uh, Augustinus, that meant, you know, other great scholars of the Platonic and Neoplatonic tradition. And I think that is a lesson one has to learn. And then a, the beautiful Italian Renaissance came out of that. And I think that is the lesson. We have to go back to the best, highest expressions of culture in each nation, each culture, and unite those. And then you can create something new out of that. And I'm absolutely convinced that that is what you have to do go back to the sources, be inner directed, don't pay attention to the, you know, digital age, you know, don't be controlled by, you know, the <clears throat> smartphone and the PlayStation and all of these things, because these things can be useful devices when you, PlayStations maybe not, but, you know, other digital devices. But you have to have an inner motivation. You can't just live off Google, you know, the Google has become a verb. This is absurd to Google something. This is ridiculous. This has nothing to do with knowledge. Only if you conquer the true ideas of a Plato, uh, of a Cusanus, Nicholas of Cus, of uh, Leibniz and many other thinkers, then you own it. So I think you can do it. You have to get a lot of young people totally excited to go to the sources, become a renaissance movement, don't be a popular slave or a slave of popular culture, be the inspirator of a renaissance movement and then we can turn it around.